Thank you very much, and, uh, and thank Dr. Peden for giving the uh, pro side. There's been data from several studies that show that protocols do not help, and I'm going to summarize the main studies that show that. And then I will spend the rest of the time pointing out to you the reasons why these studies show that protocols do not help, and also then I will point out the harmful effects of protocols on medical training. So these are six studies that have asked, are protocols superior to usual care? And this really is the question that's of most importance for physicians in routine clinical practices. So if we look here, here is the Eli study, which Dr. Peter mentioned. And here is looking at a comparison, it's a Kaplan mirror curve of the control group versus the uh, weaning protocol group. And so for to say that the protocol per se improves outcome, you need to be sure that the approach to weaning was the same in the two arms of the study. We know that in the protocol arm, that patients, 100% of them, were weaned by T-tube trials or by flow-by trials. Whereas in the control arm, 75% of them were weaned by IMV. Well, this is comparing apples and oranges. In fact, we know that IMV is the worst possible way to wean patients from the ventilator, so it's a case more of lemons rather than oranges. In fact, this study is a textbook example of the flouting of requirements for internal validity in doing research. In the Kolov uh, study, there was a tendency towards improved outcome with the protocol versus uh, usual care. They studied four intensive care units, but they achieved statistical significance in only a single ICU. And in that ICU, the Apache score was higher in the usual care arm versus the protocol arm. And in a separate study, they showed that Apache was at least as important a determinant of outcome as anything else. So then, in this study, the positive unit really is flawed again by internal validity. And the lack of internal validity makes it impossible to form a cogent conclusion from the study. The third trial looking at uh, protocols found that their protocols did uh, shorten ventilator duration in the medical ICU, but it didn't do it in the surgical ICU. And again, the investigators were unable to provide any cogent explanation for the difference between their two intensive care units. The fourth trial that we have is by Adrian Randolph, uh, looking in uh, a pediatric ICU. And the rate of weaning failure and ventilator and weaning duration was equivalent for protocols and usual care. The fifth trial is by Neyman and Ely, and they again found that protocols were of no benefit. And the sixth trial by Krishnan found that the duration of mechanical ventilation and the rate of successful weaning was the same in the usual care arm versus the protocol arm. So if we look here in terms of the six different studies, in terms of the scoreboard for the outcome of these studies, we can see that in the first six ICUs, uh, it appeared as if the protocol was superior in three of them. But in fact, two of these have flawed internal validity. So there's only one of them showing superior performance. And then in the next three studies that were performed, all three of them showed no superiority for the use of a protocol versus usual care. So the final tally is that one uh, ICU showed an improvement with protocol, a non-flawed study, versus seven that showed no difference between the two. So for physicians in practice, which is what uh, Dr. Peden was emphasizing to you, the evidence is overwhelming that protocols do not help you in your care. To try and understand why protocols 
are not helpful in managing patients. There are two deeper issues that I will try and explain to you. One is that problem is that protocolists' approach to weaning is based on the episteme, whereas in fact it is a phrenesis. And the second problem is that people advocating protocols commit the weak interpretation of history fallacy. And I'll explain each in turn. So from the dawn of civilization, there's been two approaches to knowledge, as emphasized here in Raphael's magnificent masterpiece. On the left, we have uh, Aristotle pointing up to heaven, emphasizing episteme, that, which is based on theoretical universals. And then at his side is his pupil, Aristotle, with his hand turned down to earth, emphasizing phronesis or practical reasoning. Episteme aspires to abstract exactitude. It's a subspecies of Euclid uh, geometrical knowledge. And so here you're dealing with theoretical and it's universal. And it enables the formulation of precise invariant laws, just like Euclid and its rule-governed consequences can then be predicted accurately by formal deductive logic. And that's why it works perfectly in teaching school children geometry. But for an episteme to apply to medicine, all patients would need to be a clone. And this is a major problem that protocolists make. For Phrenesis, in contrast to epicene, and phrenesis is practical reasoning, deals with events which are discrete or change over time. And so the reasoning that's required is customized decisions being made for one particular patient. And this is the difference between clinical medicine and geometry. Phrenesis deals with events which are discrete or change over time. It involves flexible interpretive capacity to determine the best action appropriate to a specific circumstance and a specific occasion, the here and the now in particular. Phrenesis considers each patient unique. Decisions are customized for each individual patient. Unlike an episteme, phrenesis is concrete, it's temporal, and it's presumptive. These are fundamentally different than the episteme or the approach that Dr. Peden was recommending to you. So phrenesis is the antithesis of a protocol. The second fundamental reason why protocols don't work, is they commit the weak interpretation of history fallacy. Advocates of, of protocols are committing this fallacy. And I will first give you an example of what the weak interpretation of history fallacy is, and then show you how it applies to we. There's numerous computer games that are based on the Battle of Gettysburg. And in these computer versions, they reproduce with great accuracy the terrain of the uh, battle, the corpse involved, and the serial chronology of events. And a moderately good player taking the Confederate side, which lost, can win in these games. Yet, Robert E. Lee, universally regarded as the best strategist on both sides, lost the Battle of Gettysburg. So how could a moderately accomplished player outperform Lee? Well, from the player today knows from the outset what Lee didn't know. Lee didn't know where the battle was going to occur, didn't know the constraints imposed by the terrain, precisely which units would be involved, and which a Union corps would be located and the trivial contingencies, and also the time scale of the battle. The determinate shape of the battle was conferred retrospectively by its outcome. There was no conclusive reasons 
for the series of events the way they turned out the way they did. Each event could have turned out otherwise. And it's impossible to incorporate all the possible contingencies into a battle plan. So the computer version does not reproduce the situation that Robert E. Lee faced. It's a quick illusion. And the error committed by Quake historians is that endings seem inevitable, but this is only after the fact. And nothing could ever happen if reality didn't kill all the other potentialities originally inherent in any given situation. So from a historical perspective, every sequence of events appears as though it could not have happened otherwise. But this is an optical, or rather an existential, illusion. So re researchers that are expecting protocols to help weaning commit the Whig fallacy. And that's the reason why the scoreboard is 7 to 1 against protocols. At the outset of a weaning attempt, there is no determinate, innumerable set of factors the totality of which comprises the situation, like for an epicene in geometry. To support, suppose otherwise, this confuses an a posteriori perspective with an a priori perspective. And this is the fallacy committed by quick historians, malpractice attorneys, and protocol advocates. The reason next is in terms of the harmful effect of protocols on resident training. And the Dreyfus brothers undertook a very careful study showing that a person passes through five different modes of decision making as skill improves between a trainee or a novice and an expert. And the novice acquires a skill by learning context-free rules with a lack of a coherent sense of the overall task. And the novice assesses his or her performance by how well he or she follows the learned rules. So basically, a novice is functioning at the uh, level one of the Dreyfus five sets of skill. It's a myth that experts use more reason or logic in fact, they use less. Experts do not make decisions in uh, their clinical care. They do what normally works. And the sense of commitment is also carefully aligned with the level of skill. And this is very important. Novices feel very limited responsibility for the product of their choice, the outcome of their choice. And they are far more skilled uh, and are the people who are at a higher level of skill in the Dreyfus system are far more emotionally committed to the outcome that results from their decisions. So protocols impedes a trainee's acquisition of the sense of responsibility. More than learning facts, a trainee needs to learn clinical judgment, how to make life and death decisions in an uncertain field, which is what daily medicine is. So a trainee needs to learn practical reasoning or phrenesis. Aristotle denied phrenesis to the young because he pointed out that phrenesis requires a knowledge of particular cases uh, that comes from experience, which a young man or woman does not possess, since experience is the fruit of years. So involvement in a large number of difficult cases and storing them in your memory is the road to phrenesis, the road for you to become a wise physician. In trying to acquire phrenesis or clinical wisdom, protocols 
sell trainees short. So why do intensivists crave after protocols, guidelines, and bundles? It's very easy. When charged with making life-threatening decisions in the midst of uncertainty, it's very easy to see the appeal of protocols and guidelines. They serve as a very powerful rhetorical trope. The hope is for a mathematical algorithm which will contain all the knowledge needed to manage a difficult situation. Thus, if it's applied in a logical, deductive manner, like Euclid, the algorithm can achieve a uniform outcome. If true, nobody could disagree with the desirability of such an approach. Algorithms have been studied extensively by scholars of every field, meteorology, navigation, jurisprudence, military strategy, the craving is universal, but it's an, a, a platonic ideal of epistemic invariant laws, which extends back for over 2,000 years. What we're talking about today is in weaning, but this debate has gone on for 2,000 years. Physicians who assert protocols really should work are ignoring the most vital part of science, that is critical thought and skepticism. Instead, they are replacing this with wishful thinking, thinking that protocols really should work. So in conclusion, to argue that protocols help weaning, you have to believe that seven is less than one. Also, that weaning protocols turned out to be worthless is really predictable from understanding the difference between phrenesis, which is the basis of clinical management, as opposed to episteme, which is a dream world derived from Euclid. And you also have to avoid the Whig interpretation of, uh, of history fallacy, where everything is understandable a posteriori, but we live in the present, we don't live in the past. And the RCTs have shown that protocols are worthless, but they have not shown the harm that results from them because the studies weren't designed to detect harm. And the harm that results from protocols is that it de deprives trainees of experience and it deprives trainees of learning phrenesis and responsibility, and also it inculcates instrumental thinking. Thank you.